I'm not sure why, but I have a bad feeling. What a coincidence. I was just thinking the same thing. Ah, something's here. What is this? This is very interesting. dy by dx is a notation often used in differentiation, but... The result of differentiating y with respect to x is written as dy by dx. This notation looks like a fraction, but dy by dx is not actually a fraction. That's how we were taught. But it seems as if dy by dx is treated as a fraction, and the denominator dx is being cancelled out. Furthermore, on the left-hand side, dy appears alone, while on the right-hand side, dx seems to exist on its own. Normally, dx and dy are used together, so they have no meaning individually. This problem is full of mysteries. By the way, we know a similar formula to this one. Do you remember it? Um, I have definitely seen a similar formula before. Now let's define z equals g of y as a function of y, and y equals f of x as a function of x. Assuming both functions are differentiable, then the derivative of z with respect to x is expressed as follows. Here, we take the derivative of z with respect to y, and multiply it by the derivative of y with respect to x, making it look as if we can cancel out dy in the numerator and the denominator. Well, it's not actually a fraction, though. This is the formula known as the chain rule, which gives the derivative of a composite function. Yes. But, I've never seen an equation like this before. After all, dx and dy have no meaning on their own. Intuitively, dx and dy represent infinitesimal changes, but their actual meaning is still unclear. There might be some hint in the definition of differentiation. Let's consider the graph of a function y equals f of x in the xy plane. Then we take a base point xy on the graph, and another point x sub 1 y sub 1, some distance away. Here if we define delta x as the change in the x direction, then delta x is expressed as x sub 1 minus x. And if we define delta y as the change in the y direction, then delta y is expressed as y sub 1 minus y. Well that makes sense. Now the ratio of the change in y to the change in x is expressed as delta y over delta x. Written explicitly it takes this form, this represents the average rate of change from x to x sub 1, or it can be considered the slope of the straight line passing through these two points. As a side note, in this diagram, we are considering the case where both delta x and delta y are positive, but in reality they can also be negative. Now let's fix x, and consider the situation where x sub 1 approaches x. Then it looks like this, and we obtain the tangent line at x. Let me go back to the previous state. If we express what we just did in mathematical terms, f prime of x or dy by dx is the limit of delta y over delta x as delta x approaches zero. This value represents the instantaneous rate of change at x, or it can be considered the slope of the tangent line. In other words, by making delta x approach zero, if delta y over delta x approaches a certain value, then that value is represented by the notation dy by dx. You're right. If we consider that a value f prime of x is determined for each x, then f prime of x can be regarded as a function of x. This is what we call the derivative of f. This limit does not always exist, but for now let's assume it does. Also if we write delta y explicitly, the numerator can be expressed like this. But, we won't be using this formula this time, so let's set it aside. How do you already know we won't use it? Anyway, do you remember now that dy by dx is defined this way? Now that you mention it, I guess that was the case. dy by dx is not a fraction, but delta y delta x is a fraction, so we can say that dy by dx is the limit of the fraction. That's why it can sometimes be calculated as if it were a fraction. However, dy by dx is merely a notation representing this limit, and dx and dy are not defined individually. Oh yeah. It makes me feel restless. If dx and dy are supposed to represent infinitesimal changes, can't we assign them independent meanings? Ah, I got it. I've come up with a great idea. We define dy by dx as a whole like this, but what if we define dx and dy separately instead? First, since dx corresponds to delta x, let's define dx as the limit of delta x. This represents the infinitesimal change in the x direction. Next, let's define dy as the limit of delta y. This represents the infinitesimal change in the y direction. Now we've successfully defined dx and dy separately. 
Sundaman, I'm sorry to say this, but if we let delta x approach zero, then the limit of delta x is zero. What? dx was supposed to represent an infinitesimal change in x, but instead it became zero. And for this limit to have a finite value, the numerator must approach zero as the denominator approaches zero, meaning that delta y must also approach zero. Therefore, under this definition, it's reasonable to conclude that dy also becomes zero. Oh my. With this, we can't combine dx and dy to calculate dy by dx. When we take the limits separately, in the x and y directions, some information is lost. Is it impossible to assign independent meanings to dx and dy? Ah, watch out, a hint is coming. I've been waiting for this. This is... Ah, uh, what does this mean? It says dx is equal to delta x. Since delta x is a real number, this means dx is not actually representing an infinitesimal change. And dy is different from delta y? Hmm, I don't get it at all. I see. I might have just realized it. What do you mean? Earlier when we considered the graph of the function y equals f of x, we took two points on the graph. But this time, let's take two points on the tangent line instead. One of these will be the point of tangency. Hmm, okay, I follow so far. I still don't really understand what you're trying to do though. Just watch. You see how this forms a right triangle? Now let's define dx as the base length, and dy as the height. What? So these are dx and dy? That's completely different from what I imagined. Well fine, I'll listen till the end. Then let me continue. Since dx represents the change in x, it can be calculated as uppercase x minus lowercase x. On the other hand, since dy represents the change in y, it can be calculated as uppercase y minus lowercase y. Looking at the diagram, we can see that dx coincides with delta x. However, dy and delta y do not necessarily coincide, because the point on the tangent line do not necessarily coincide with the point on the graph. Ah, okay. These definitions seem a bit strange, but if we define them this way, since dy over dx represents the slope of the tangent line, it directly becomes f prime of x. That's right. And if we multiply both sides of this equation by dx, the left-hand side becomes dy, and the right-hand side becomes f prime of x dx. Here if we use the definitions of dx and dy, the left-hand side is expressed like this, and the right-hand side is expressed like this. And in fact this equation is actually the equation of the tangent line. Huh? Wait a second. What do you mean? If we fix lowercase x and y, and move uppercase x and y, uppercase x y moves along the entire tangent line, with the slope f prime of x. If this doesn't quite make sense, feel free to ignore it for now. Well if we do it this way, we can preserve the meaning of the notation dy by dx, while still defining dx and dy separately. But something still feels off. This just defines dx and dy, in a way that makes their ratio equal to f prime of x, which feels like we're forcing the definition. Also, I don't see how this definition represents infinitesimal changes. I can understand why you feel that way. When you first hear this definition, it might feel like you're being tricked in some way. So let's reconsider what we mean by infinitesimal change. The ratio of the change in y to the change in x was expressed as delta y over delta x. If f prime of x exists, then for sufficiently small delta x, delta y over delta x can approximate f prime of x. Let's denote the error as epsilon. Now we'll fix x. If we let delta x approach zero, then the error epsilon should also approach zero. Hmm, okay. I still don't really get what you're trying to do, but I understand up to this point. Ah, if we keep going this way, won't the discussion start from f prime of x again? You're right, that would be a problem. So just to be sure, let's set up the situation this way. When delta x is sufficiently small, let's assume that delta y over delta x approximates some value a of x. Using this assumption by examining the properties of delta x and delta y, we can investigate what exactly an infinitesimal change is. Here, a of x is meant to resemble f prime of x, but we are not assuming that they are necessarily equal. Well, if that's the case, then fine. Now let's denote the error between delta y over delta x and a of x as epsilon. If we let delta x approach zero, then epsilon should also approach zero. Starting from this equation, what happens when we let delta x approach zero? Um, 
If we take the limit of delta y over delta x as delta x approaches zero, this is exactly the definition of f prime of x. On the right hand side, since a of x does not depend on delta x, it remains unchanged. Since the error epsilon approaches zero, it disappears in the limit as delta x approaches zero. Oh, this is... Ah, this is it! A of x turns out to be f prime of x after all. So, we have now confirmed that they are the same. Also, if we take a closer look at this equation, multiplying both sides by delta x, the left-hand side becomes delta y. And the right-hand side is expressed in this way, using delta x. Now, as delta x approaches zero, a of x does not depend on delta x. But epsilon does depend on delta x and approaches zero. This means that the second term becomes much smaller than delta x. In other words, when delta x is sufficiently small, ignoring the small part relative to delta x, leaves the first term as the principal part of delta y. Thus we define dy as the principal part of the small change in y. This is called the differential dy. Note that this differential is different in meaning from the derivative. The principal part of the small change. So that's what dy means. Now since a of x turned out to be f prime of x, dy is ultimately expressed in this form. Here, as a special case of dy, let's consider how dx is expressed. If we consider x as a function that simply returns x itself, then instead of f prime of x we just need to calculate x prime. Since differentiating x with respect to x gives 1, we conclude that dx is equal to delta x. In other words, the principal part of the small change in x is just delta x itself. Now I can see the answer. From these two equations, we obtain the relationship between dy and dx. What a beautiful formula. Since f prime of x acts as the coefficient when expressing the differential dy in terms of dx, it's quite fitting that this was once called the differential coefficient. Also if we divide both sides by dx, we see that this is exactly dy by dx we are familiar with. Hmm, this seems like a reasonable approach. The principal part of a small change I see, but still delta x is not an infinitesimal it's just a real number. So dy and dx are not infinitesimals either, it's a little sad. You're right, this definition does not claim that dy and dx are infinitesimals. However, one possible interpretation is, since we are keeping x fixed, we can regard dy and dx as functions of delta x. Here, delta x represents the change measured from x. And as delta x approaches zero, dy and dx also approach zero. In other words, instead of considering the ratio of two infinitesimals at x, we consider the ratio of two functions that approach zero arbitrarily closely, as delta x approaches zero. And the key point is that this ratio remains constant regardless of delta x. Ha, huh, is that so? Now, looking back at today's problem, if we rewrite dy by dx as f prime of x, this formula can be seen as describing how dy and dx are related by the differential coefficient. Finally, this relationship feels pretty natural. Today, we explored a way to give independent meaning to dx and dy, but in fact, this is not the only approach. Other approaches, such as differential forms or non-standard analysis, are also well known. That sounds really complicated. Our method is elementary, and stays within the realm of real numbers. So it can be considered the most fundamental approach. Well then, take care everyone! See you again!